If you'd like to follow along with the beginning of our reading this morning, then open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. Much of what we'll be doing together in Scripture will be found throughout that letter, so I encourage you to settle somewhere around Hebrews chapter 3. Uh, yesterday was a, an emotional and special day, a joyful day in many ways for my family and me. Most of us traveled down south so that we could remember a good friend of mine, a mentor in the faith, my favorite preacher who had passed away last week, Mr. Tony Mock. And we had the occasion to talk about his life and his influence. And I want to thank all the people who showed support and some came down to support us. And it was really a wonderful time in that way because we know what glory he enjoys because of his faith. But in the second half of what I was able to share with everyone, I just talked about his sermons. His sermons were titled so awesomely and they were catchy and they were deep and they gave you thought for years and years later. And I won't share all those with you today, but I just love the way he approached the sharing of the scripture. But I had occasion yesterday to tell that group of people about my favorite sermon by my favorite preacher. Uh, he preached it quite a few years ago. I was about 25 when I first heard this sermon, and I just fell in love with the idea. I preached it several times without asking him, just took it and went with it. But more than that, it really seeded an emotional change towards grace in my life that has continued to grow. And so today I want to share with you that sermon, but I need to tell you a little bit about timing preaching and study and timing. It's amazing the way God works. Before I heard this sermon, I was going through an interesting cycle of life. You see, I was raised, like many of you, among God's people in really healthy and wonderful environments. I was taught about the Bible and God. I was taught about the gospel and Jesus. I was taught about how to become a Christian. I was taught about the church. I was taught about the authority of God, taught very well like many of you, and treasured those things. But moving through my teenage years into my 20s into preaching, for me at least, that had begun to translate into confidence based on my works. That's how I knew that I was saved. I knew that I was saved because I knew the truth, knowledge. I knew that I was saved because I went to the right church. I knew that I was saved because I was doing and preaching and teaching the right things. Yes, Jesus was a part of it. Listen to my language. But a lot of the confidence came by how pretty good I was getting at becoming a Christian. In my worst moments, I genuinely believed that by the time I was 44, God could give the grace to everyone else. I was growing at a great rate, and eventually I would be able to kind of carry this on my own. But as I got into my 20s and life started to happen, anybody know about that? And you start wrestling with the demons that know how to knock on your back door and work their way in, and started a family, and started seeing that I'm so woefully imperfect, and that I'll be fighting things my whole life, and even God's people, we've got work to do, and we don't have it all figured out, and we have a lot of things to work through, my confidence started to wane a lot. You see, that's the problem. If my confidence is in me, and I realize that I'm not the hot stuff I thought I was, what happens to all my confidence? It is all drained away. And then I'm like 25 years old, and I'm teaching a Bible class in Mauriceville, Texas, and somebody raises their hand and uses a phrase that I wish I'd never heard. If I could just eliminate these three words from my vocabulary, I would have slept a lot better. Somebody in class says, Chris, what about the sins of omission? What is that? I'm worried about the sins that I commit, you know, like I need to, I know I'm, I'm struggling with sins. You're telling me there's this whole list of sins that I don't even know that I'm not doing? I'm dealing with my own weakness that I can't even, I can't even stay away from all the wrong things. And you're telling me since I got up this morning, I've omitted a handful of right things that I don't even recognize. And God's going, sin, 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 sin. like I'm done. Why are we even here? I went through a lot of that. Have you been through that? That's what happens when we get things out of order and it's like I've, I've got to live the right life so that I can show the right faith so that God may be gracious to me and you realize that you're not strong enough to get the whole thing going or keep it going. It was in that moment, in those times, that I heard Tony Mock preach this sermon. And it was titled, It is Hard to Be Lost. 
Is that true? I'm kind of thinking it's really easy to be lost. You just make some mistakes and you're lost. You do something you shouldn't do and you don't repent in time and you're, and you're lost. You, you, your mistakes start piling up on you and, and those sins of omission that I wish didn't even exist start like wrapping you up and, and you start realizing that you have lifelong problems. I mean, I was in a point in my life where I, grace had gotten so kind of far from my thinking and I was letting myself down that, that I was thinking that most of us are probably going to be lost. And here's Tony going, actually... If your confidence is in the right place, if your confidence is in the right person, if you understand the strength that is not your strength, that is his strength, you will understand that it's, it's actually very difficult to lose your soul. And he dove into that study, and I want to dig into it in the book of Hebrews with you. And that's what he used was the book of Hebrews to make his points. Now, let me say a couple of things to make sure you understand what's being said here, because Tony said it this way, and so will I. One thing we need to say is that outside of Christ, it is impossible to be saved. This is not some message that says, in the end, most people are probably going to be saved because it's actually really hard not to be. If you're not in a relationship with Jesus, you cannot be saved. The Bible talks about Jesus himself says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody gets to the Father, nobody gets to grace, nobody gets to heaven unless they do so through Jesus Christ. So let me be very clear about this statement. I'm talking to Christians. Are you a Christian? I'm talking to people who have entered into a relationship with Jesus and who have put on a relationship with Christ. It is hard for those people to be lost. But I need to add a second thing. We are not saying that it is impossible for a Christian to be lost. Are you understanding what I'm saying? We're not saying that once you're a Christian and you're in Christ, God does everything from there on in and it's just all going to work out really no matter what you do. That's not what the Bible says. And the book of Hebrews, above every other New Testament letter, keeps telling you that. Look at these passages with me. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. What I'm telling you is this is the very letter that's going to convince you how hard it is to be lost but it's that exact letter that tells you to be careful because it is still possible. In chapter 3, in verse 12, the Bible says, Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Can someone fall away? They absolutely can. Even a Christian. It's the saddest thing. And that's kind of my argument today. God has done so much to save you tirelessly poured himself into you. But yes, in the end, if you want out, you can get out. Chapter 6. Chapter 6 talks about that same idea. Look with me in that text and about verse 4. He says, look, there are cases of those who have been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the ages to come, and then have fallen away. He said, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put Him to open shame. That text says you can receive all the richness of the blessings of God, and you can choose to leave those behind, and you go, well, what does that verse mean? It says it's impossible. The things that I'm about to show you from the book of Hebrews are so strong and amazing, they should convince everyone here to put God before everything else in your life. But if you hear these things and they don't touch your heart, nothing's going to touch your heart. That's what he means. If that which God has done for you is not enough for you to fall in love with him, I got no other sermon coming. I can't convince you through any other means. That's what he means. He says if you've lost your taste for him, there is nothing that can ever start it again except for him. Chapter 12, I'm just showing you this idea that it's impossible to be lost is simply not a biblical concept. Chapter 12 and in verse 12, Hebrews 12 and verse 12, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. Make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. What do you mean? That no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and by it many be defiled. You can have a bitter heart even after having a saved heart. Part of that, I think, comes through 
misinformation. Remember how I told you about teenage years and 20s? I was leaning into this idea that my confidence was in my accomplishments. And then my accomplishments started to show themselves weak and I'm, I'm blaming God and I'm losing my assurances and I get bitter at the Lord. And the problem is I didn't get it that my salvation comes from the Lord. That it's His power and His grace and His righteousness and not my own. And I missed that and I got bitter. I don't want you to get bitter like that. I want you to understand the confidence that comes in Him and not yourself. Look in chapter 10. This is actually kind of the reason for the letter. The reason for the letter is you had a bunch of Christians in this region who had given their lives over to the Lord, but it got hard. It gets hard. You know, they had gone in and started losing their possessions. People were arresting them and people were taking their things and they were really sacrificing, but they didn't care because God's salvation was so great, it didn't matter what it cost them. But, you know, after a few years, that gets a little wearisome. And so in chapter 10 and verse 32, but remember the former days. He's telling these Christians, remember how it all started for you? When after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of suffering, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations. This is Hebrews 10, 33. And partly by becoming shares with those who were so treated. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and you accepted joyfully the seizure of your property knowing that you for yourselves have a better possession and a lasting one. Remember the days when God's offer of heaven dominated your thinking? The fact that God would even take you there, that he wants you there, that he's done so many things to bring. Remember when that was so important that you were just, you didn't care? You didn't care about what else happened to you? He said, do not throw away your confidence. Tony, one of his greatest sermons was do not throw away your confidence. Hear me very clearly. If your confidence is in you, you may as well throw it away because it's not going to last anyway. It's not going to last. You will let yourself down in enough ways so that you keep coming to church, hoping that eventually you'll get enough things right, that everything will pan out with God. You won't and it won't, so stop it. But I'll tell you something better. What if your confidence is in the Lord and your faithfulness is a response to His grace. Limitless, perfect, and amazing. Can I show it to you? I'm going to show you five things really fast, five words. Really, and that's not really preacher speak. Like, I'm really going to go through this quickly. Go back to Hebrews 1. Why is it hard for the believer to be lost? Number one, it is hard because of Jesus. Do you see that coming? I hope you saw that coming. Listen to how the letter opens. God, it starts with God the Father, and we'll, we'll note that in a moment. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through also he made the world. And he, this Son of his, is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels just as he inherited a more excellent name than they. Quick note before we mention Jesus. Do you even have you read through the Old Testament do you realize how far God goes to save his people? Have you read the Old Testament? He goes to unbelievable lengths to save his people. He sends them prophet after prophet after prophet after priest after law after idea. He'll punish them a little bit just so he can bring them back. Everything he does in terms of difficulty for them is to train them to come back. They commit adultery on him. He brings them back. Like God, in many portions and ways, devoted his entire existence at the time to just saving his people. But then he gave his best shot. He went farther than he'd ever gone before, and he offered his only son, Jesus Christ. Who did he offer? His son. What did Jesus do? He accomplished purification of sins. Jesus accomplishes purification of sins in his life and in your soul. You do not. He does. And where is he? Who is he? God's son. What did he do? 
made for purification of sins. Where is he now? Sitting, verse 3, at the right hand of God in a place of great magnitude. Do not overlook the simple, beautiful verses that ought to be the reason why you are here today. If I ask you what those verses were, you may quote things about stuff you need to do and how you need to do it and why you need to do it. And I would say, slow your roll. You know why I'm here today? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. His only begotten son. That whoever choose, choice, yours, whoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I want you to think of it in this way. He gave you the very best thing that he had. He gave fully the best thing that he had. A God who's always pursuing salvation said, this is the fullness of that plan. If your eyes are on Jesus, if your belief is in Jesus, if you are filled with gratitude for Jesus, can I just tell you, it's going to be hard to be lost. Because he will be your light, your life, your bread, your water, you're everything. Number two, he mentions in verse four that he made him better than the angels, and then he starts talking about angels. I happen to know everything about angels, and I'm going to tell you about that today. I think I just did. I think I told you everything I knew. Not much. But I know what the Bible says about them. I know that they're created spiritual beings that exist in the world. I know verse 14 that they are ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation. I know God made angels to serve you. I know God has sent his ministering spirits into this world to be in every room you walk in and to be everywhere that you go and to lend assistance to you that you can't even imagine. And that's what they do. I remember the story of Elisha and his servant in 2 Kings. Do you remember that story? And the servant's like, what are we going to do? The armies are terrible and we're going to lose. And for just a second, God opened the eyes of that servant. And what did he see? Angels everywhere. He saw angels across the whole mountainside. And not just passive little angels playing harps. He saw them on fiery chariots. With hor he saw warriors. He saw an angelic Army, Where is that angelic army? If you think it's gone, you don't know God. They are here. They are all around us. You are never alone. God created beings for our benefit. You don't have to turn there if you don't want to, but I just went back to Psalm 103 for a minute, just for a second, to read a, a psalm about the angels. Uh, this is a very important psalm for me. Uh, in the service yesterday at the very end, I mentioned my last moments with my friend Tony. It was a few days before he passed away, and he could barely speak. And when I got there, I think he said two things to me the whole day. When I got there, he put his hand on my face, and he said my name, and then nothing for hours. And then at the end of it all, I said, Tony, I want to read your favorite psalm. But I don't know what it is because you like so many psalms. So I'm going to say psalm and you see if you can utter something and I'll read it. And I said psalm and he went 103. That's the last thing he ever said to me was 103. And so that was the last thing I said to them yesterday was 103. You're not going to believe it, but I read Psalm 103 and just got down. I didn't commentate or preach. But in Psalm 103, listen to verses 19 through 22. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens. His sovereignty rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, mighty in strength, who perform his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you who serve him doing his will. Bless the Lord, all you works of his and all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. I bless the Lord from my soul because of the angels that God has sent to carry out his will to help me and guide me and strengthen me. You remember Ephesians 6, where it talks about the spiritual warfare? How are you at that? You got a sword in your closet you can use against the spiritual armies of darkness? If you're trying to use your own physical sword to do it, you don't have a lot of confidence, do you? What if I told you there was an entire angelic army of glory fighting those demons on your behalf? around you ever. I don't think it's far away. I think it's in the room. You just haven't been given the eyes yet, nor I, to see it. When I think about the angels, 
who were sent for our benefit, who are ministering spirits on our behalf, who one day I'm going to get to see. I've asked God for a peek. He said no a bunch. If you, would your life change if for 10 seconds you could see the spiritual? You could see the angels? The only thing that would diminish is a really important quality that you're carrying with you today, and that quality is, is faith. When my eyes are focused on what I cannot yet see and the way that God has built an army for me, it is hard to be lost because I'm not, I'm not walking away from that. Go to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. He warns us on the heels of this when he talks about salvation. And not just salvation, but he calls it so great a salvation. And we'll note that for just a moment. But look in verses 1 through 4. There's still this warning that you can leave it if you want to. If God's salvation isn't great enough for you, if it's not complete enough for you, sometimes people leave it because they don't understand how complete it is. Can I just say this to you? Focus for a second. Sometimes they go, well, it's part him, but it's a lot me, and I'm going to have to meet him halfway, and I'm going to have to clear these hurdles, and I can't, and I'm tired of trying, and I quit. You don't know his salvation. That's why you quit. If you knew the completeness of his salvation for those who believe and devote their lives to trying to serve him, you would never quit. The problem is you think it's too much about you. He says, look, for this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. He said, because of the angels, by the way. So that we do not drift away from it. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was at the first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who believed. In other words, the salvation isn't picked out of thin air like Jesus came and preached it. He unrolled the scroll. He said the favorable day of the Lord, the day that the captives get to go free, the day that the blind get to see, look for, that's me. That's what I'm here to do. And then he proved it through miracles, signs, and wonders. God was testifying with them by those signs and wonders, various miracles, gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will. This is a good question. Can I ask you this question right in the middle of this lesson? How great is God's salvation for you? How great is it? Is it the greatest thing that's ever happened to you? Is it the greatest promise you've ever been made? Is it the greatest hope that you've ever had? Is it assured? Or is this salvation like partial? It's like uh, there were some articles written like 50 years ago about yo-yo salvation. Anybody heard that? You sin, you're done. You say you're sorry, he saves you again. You sin, you're done. Those yo-yos wrote that yo-yo stuff. This idea that, that you, you know, salvation is like a tease. You know, it's like, here's some, but oh, I didn't like that. I'm taking that away. Like, because then it's dependent on who? Who's it dependent on then? It's on you now. It's on every little mistake and every sins of omission, anyone? That's a terrifying thought. Erase that. That's like, I don't even know what I've not done that's displeased God. My string is cut. He said, no, you don't understand. My salvation is by grace you have been saved, Ephesians 2. By grace you have been saved through faith, not as a result of works, lest no man should boast. And then he goes on to say, and if that means to you what it's supposed to mean, you'll go out there and do everything you can to serve me. But you will do it because of my salvation, not to earn it. Not to prove that you're worthy of it. Let it go and let him save you. I was thinking about 1 Peter. I love the, let me just mention it to you. 1 Peter 1, if you want to read about salvation, I'll oh, go ahead. Let's go over there. 1 Peter 1. I won't tell you what I told him yesterday. I said, I don't know what time it is and I don't care. But we do actually have a clock here. There we didn't. I think they put one up today after I left. 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm just going to read verses 3 through 9. I want to tell you a little bit about your salvation. I'm talking about, listen, it's impossible without Christ. I'm talking about somebody who has believed in Jesus, who has obeyed the simple, not earning, not hard, just, just basic commands of him to turn from sin and be buried with him. And now you just, you pursue him out of love, not out of like personal proof. I just want you to know about that salvation. Blessed be, verse 3, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy, great salvation, great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through him, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain, I love this word, an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, you who are protected 
protected by the power of God. Through what? Through faith. For a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice. Great salvation, great mercy, great power, great rejoicing. Even though now, yes, for a little while, if necessary, sure. You've been distressed by various trials. So that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, you believe in him. You greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. I love the language. I need to move on, but I love the language. Salvation isn't some punch card that he gives you, but he knows right where it is in your pocket. and He'll grab it at any moment. Salvation is you being adopted into the family of God. Is that the way adoptions work? You adopt a child in, but they get three strikes and, you know, you adopt them in, but you can, I'll disown you as fast as I, is that the way parents talk to their, their children? We've done that with a couple of our, our blood kids. No. You're my, you're my child now. You're in line for an inheritance that's going to blow your socks off. I want you to keep trusting me and know this and love me for this. I'm at church today because I love God for his salvation. The works come. They always come. Obedience comes. It always comes. But it comes in the right place and it comes for the right reasons. Number four, go to the end of Hebrews nearly to chapter 12 as we wrap up. Number four are the witnesses. We're not the first ones to do this, you know. We're not the first people asked to just like lean into the Lord and just have faith in Him and go, He's going to be here for me and, and I can do this and I'm not going to lose focus. And I'm going to, like, we're not the first ones to do that. A lot of people have done that. The whole chapter 11 is about people like Abraham and Moses and Sarah and Joseph and Daniel and Samson. People who by faith obeyed. The faith and obedience are not the same thing. It is because... I trust you. He believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Abraham said, I believe you. That's it. I'm with you. And then he went out and he obeyed him. He didn't obey him to clear some threshold of acceptance. He obeyed him because he trusted in him. Men by faith, they are our witnesses, men and women. The reason why they were so strong, though, is because they never lost sight of the salvation. Verse 13 talks about how they died in faith. There are a lot of promises they didn't receive. They didn't get a lot of payout here. But verse 16, they desired a better country. They were living for heaven. Are you living for heaven? God's salvation isn't going to come tomorrow, at least not in a way you can fully appreciate it. It comes in heaven. And so he goes on to say, these are men, verse 38, of whom the world is not worthy. And when he gets to chapter 12, verse 1, he says, therefore, because these people live for heaven, because I gave them heaven... I mean, think about it. Like Peter, James, and John actually got to see Moses and Elijah. How things work out for Moses and Elijah? Well, there's Moses and there's Elijah and they're in heaven. The witnesses made it. That's the way it works. In chapter 12, verse 1, since we have so great, it's hard to be lost when our eyes are on these. So great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Let us lay aside every encumbrance like they did. Let us lay aside this sin that tries to draw our attention tonight. I hope you come back tonight. We're going to revisit the temptations of Jesus and maybe find some things we hadn't seen before. But I'm going to lay those things aside because Jesus is my witness and he chose God and it worked out really good for him. And I want to do that too. And I want to run with endurance the race that's set before me. I don't know how you look at this. Tony was someone very close to me. I've got a new witness in the clouds. His name is Anthony Mock. He made hard choices. He stayed with the Lord. He preached about glory as often as he possibly could. And now he has entered into a place of glory. And if he can see down here, he's going, let's go. Come on. I'm telling you. It's not what you thought. It's infinitely better. Do you have anybody like that? I remember Tony, I mentioned it last night. There were four people he was looking forward to seeing. I mean, Jesus and stuff, of course, but witnesses in his lifetime. His parents died just two years ago. He said, I'm going to go see my mom and I'm going to go see my dad. And he mentioned two preachers, Mr. D. Bowman and Mr. Robert Jackson. They were his witnesses going, trust me. 
This is worth everything. You keep your eyes on where they are and how you want to see them again and how quickly we might get there. It's hard to be lost. It would be hard to walk away. Maybe even for the person of faith, impossible. Cloud of witnesses. Last thing, he is the Alpha and the Omega. You can't start with Jesus and like build to a great fifth point that's not Jesus. He begins everything, Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, and he's the end of everything. In chapter 12, we do have this great cloud of witnesses, this people of faith who show us what it's really about. But he says, don't forget, you've got to fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. He's the author and perfecter of faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross. He went through so many things. He endured the cross with joy, despised the shame of this world, and now he is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him. Consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. I'm going to tell you right now, when your eyes are fixed on Jesus and you consider all that he did and you consider the person for whom he did it and you consider where he now is, you will not grow weary, you will not fall away, you will not lose your salvation. It will be impossible. There's not a single person whose eyes are on their Savior who will lose their way. I remember a lesson last year I, I taught, um, I said something like, I, I have a little once saved, always saved in me, and man, preachers ran with that idea. After I'd done this whole like five-minute deal on anti-Calvinistic ideas, but here's what I mean by that. I mean that if Jesus is the center of your life and the angels he has sent for you are ever recognized in your presence and his great salvation is the greatest gift you've ever been offered and really the most wonderful reason to even be alive and there are people of faith who've gone before and paved the way and you will follow them and you will see them and it is your passion and Jesus is the author of your faith. He wrote the book on your faith and he is the one who exhibited that faith and you yearn to stare at him. Can you even be lost? That's what I mean. Not when he is everything to us. The letter says you can, but you would have to be the one to choose it. What I'm here to tell you is what God has offered you is so good that no one in their right mind would. Okay, that's probably insulting to somebody who's like wandering from the faith. I'll say it more politely. You're not in your right mind. You're in your carnal mind. You're in your natural mind. You're in the mind of our culture. You're in the mind of this world, but you're not in your right mind. Those things are limited. Those things will pass away. I want to finish with Romans 8. Romans 8. Got to read this yesterday, too. Romans 8. My confidence is in Jesus Christ. My confidence is in His rule and His grace. His grace changes my heart, and as my heart changes, guess what else changes? My life changes. Here's what we know about God and His salvation. What then shall we say to these things, Romans 8, 31? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him over for, for us all, how will He not also with Him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus, verse 34, is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who intercedes for us. We haven't even mentioned that. Who will separate, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, will distress, will persecution, will famine, will nakedness, will peril, will sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we're being put to death all day long, who are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through, pause for dramatic effect, Him. We conquer through Him. And his love for us. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things that are coming, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor any created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Awesome. I'm secured. I am saved in Christ. I am confident in him. I think we struggle with that a little bit. Like if you're confident in your salvation, isn't that a little bit of you promoting you? If that's the reason you think you're confident, then yeah, we need to, we need to talk about this. 
My confidence in him. Now, I was teaching this one time, Romans 8, in a Bible class right here, and someone over there, great guy, Joe Harding, raised his hand. And Joe said, you know, there's one person missing from Romans 8. It says nothing can separate you from the grace of God. Nothing can separate you from him. Not the powers, not the devil, not the demons, not the world. But he said there's one person missing from the list in Romans 8. You know who it is? That's the only person not in that list. Is you. I don't want to put any pressure on you. But it's really hard to be lost when we love the Lord. And we understand his glory. But the reason why it's not impossible is one little factor. You. Now, let me be careful with that. I don't mean you accomplishing things, you proving things, you mastering things. Come on, we're past that. I mean you living by faith in His grace to the praise of His worthy glory. Grace to faith to life. You're going to face some tough times. You're going to wonder where he is. That's faith being tested. You're not going to understand everything. You guys remember Peter? I don't think Peter understood anything Jesus ever said. I don't think there's a thing that Jesus said that, that, that Peter said, did you mean this? And Peter's like, yeah, that was, and Jesus like, that was right. I don't think that ever happened. But in a weird moment in John 6, when everybody was leaving Jesus because they didn't understand, they were thinking too carnally. Jesus looked at Peter and said, you, you leaving too? I guess it would have been easy to leave, right? Everybody was leaving. It been easy to leave. Do you remember what Peter said? To whom shall I go? You have the words of eternal life. It's hard to be lost when he has the words of eternal life, and you know that's what's coming. If you're ready to be saved in him, he makes that easy also. It's a submission to his will. It's the desire to serve him after you've professed that you believe in him, and you get buried in water. And it doesn't, I'll do it to you. you don't, it doesn't take any skill. But it does take a heart of submission that wants to die with him and be reunited in him because of Jesus and the angels and salvation and the witnesses and the wonderful Son of God. If you need to become a Christian or if you're ready to live confidently in him and you think we can help, come now as we stand and sing.